Hey guys, today we're reading chapter eight called Searching for Ginger Pie. Do you think they're gonna find him? With the disappearance of Ginger Pie on Thanksgiving day, the biggest search there ever was in Cranberry began. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of the Thanksgiving weekend, Jerry and Rachel covered the entire town looking for their puppy, calling him and asking everybody they met if they had seen such a dog as they described. He's brown and white and has almost no tail and he has elegant, they meant eloquent, eyes, they explained eagerly, and they said, he answers to the name of Ginger, Ginger Pie, Ginger Pop, or just Pop, or Puppy. What a great many names, one lady said, confused. It depends on how you say it if he'll come, said Rachel. She envisioned a big class of cranberry people learning how to call Ginger the right way, with affection and authority, and then all of these people going around everywhere, calling and calling. No one they asked had seen Ginger. They went up the country roads on the outskirts of town, and they went along the shore, looking at all the little red boat houses. With their heels crunching on the wafer-thin ice, they made their way out to the end of Gooseneck Point to ask the lighthouse keeper if he had seen a little lost dog. He had not. They saw no trace of Ginger anywhere. It was as though the earth had swallowed him. How had he gotten out of the yard? That was the puzzle. They decided that probably someone must have climbed over the fence. The fence, no doubt, that bordered the side street where Uncle Benny had seen the hat that first Sunday that they had Ginger. The person may have tempted Ginger with a piece of candy. Then he may have thrown a coat over Ginger, clamped his jaws together so he couldn't make a sound. Ginger may have whimpered, but the pies would not have heard because of all the eating of drumsticks and the laughter and the conversation. He must have been stolen while dinner was going on. The thief must have plotted this from the beginning to steal ginger pie while Thanksgiving dinner was being eaten. Edgar, said Mama to Papa, I told you some time ago there seems to have been some sort of unsavory character around. I know it, Lucy, said Papa, looking troubled and hurt and running his fine hand through his thin red hair. He could not understand how anyone could steal a pet belonging to a child. He just could not understand it, and he stomped through the house, shaking his head sternly. Jerry could understand it. Everybody in the whole town, almost, knew about Ginger on the fire escape and made comments on the intellectual dog because they had read the story in the Cranberry Chronicle. Not many extraordinary events happened in Cranberry, and when one did, the ins and outs of it were naturally discussed at length for many, many days. Even the teacher in Jerry's class got over being angry about the hullabaloo when she read the story in the paper and read her name there and found out that she was famous, too. Probably the unsavory character had read the story of Ginger on the fire escape, and this made him decide once and for all to get a hold of the brilliant puppy. It would be hard to say why all the pies thought the unsavory character was a man and not a woman, a boy, or a girl, for no one had ever really seen him. They had heard his footsteps. They had seen his hat on four occasions. Since his old felt hat looked like the hat of a man, naturally they had just reached the conclusion that the unsavory character was a man, without even considering the other possibilities. This shows that the pies were not good detectives, but, not, but none of them ever thought for a minute thought about themselves as detectives. Mr. Pie thought of himself as a bird man and a father. Mrs. Pie as a mother and a housewife. Jerry as a rock man and a boy, and Rachel as a birdman and a girl. There was not a detective among them. There wasn't even a detective in the whole town of Cranberry, for that matter, but there was a chief of police named Mr. Larimore, and they intended to speak to him. First, however, it was sensible to ask Mrs. Speedy, who was out of the hospital now, to try and rack her brains a little and see if she could remember what the other person looked like who had wanted to buy Ginger in the first place. They did this before they went to the chief of police. In spite of none of them being detectives, this was a very astute step for the Pikes to take. After all, Mrs. Speedy was the only person who had ever really seen the unsavory character. That is, if that person who had wanted Ginger and waved the dollar at her and this person who had stolen Ginger were the one and the same. That, of course, they did not know and would not know, but they all had the feeling that they were the same. So the pies went to Mrs. Speedy, and she said so many people had come to her dairy for eggs or milk or butter or perhaps to buy a chicken, and last August was such a long time away, you bet, that she couldn't say whether it was a man, woman, or a child, and she wouldn't want to get the innocent in trouble, you bet. She said if it ever got to the point where women served on the jury, she would always say innocent, you bet. Moreover, she was awfully absent-minded and had had that stroke, so she could not walk or talk awfully well. 
and it was a wonder, considering she was awful, also a little deaf, and did not see too well either, that she remembered Ginger and Jerry after all these months, let alone remembering what the other party looked like. No, she could not recollect the other person, but it was a shame that Ginger was gone. A shame, you bet, she said. But then they, as they were leaving, she said, I remember now, that person had a curious hat on. It seems to me it was yellow. Yes, on the yellow, my, you bet. The pies thanked her gratefully. They appreciated the interest she had shown in the description of the hat, but they knew no more than in the beginning. Anyway, it was undoubtedly because of the hat that Jerry and Rachel, and in fact all of them, had it firmly fixed in their mind that the unsavory character was a man. Rachel and Jerry were so sure of this, they drew a picture of him, imagining what the horrid person must look like. The picture they drew of the man was on the order of the slick villains in the moving pictures, with a black mustache. Once the picture was drawn that way, they couldn't think of him as looking any different. When they went with Mr. Pye to Chief Larimore, they brought the original drawing with them to help him spot the man. While they were waiting to see Chief Larimore, there was no one ahead of them, but Chief Larimore always gave, kept people waiting to give the appearance that he was busy. Rachel and Jerry examined the criminal's po roster posted on the bulletin board in the town hall. They wanted to see if any of these criminals looked like the way they had drawn unsavory. After a careful comparison, they decided there was no one like their villain. Anyway, the criminals in this roster were not cranberry criminals because until now there were no cranberry criminals. These, whose pictures were in the town hall, were nationwide criminals who held up trains and made fake money and committed such crimes. They were hardly the sort of man unsavory was who just stole dogs. When they finally got to see Chief Larimer and Jerry had shown him unsavory's character picture, the policeman was very interested and said Jerry and Rachel should go to art school. They told him the whole story, bringing him in about the mysterious footsteps and Mrs. Speedy and the yellow felt hat. Chief Larimore said he knew of no such character, but he would be on the lookout. Chief Larimore was a new and young chief of police, having succeeded the recently retired and notable Cranberry citizen, Chief Mulligan. He was anxious to do a good job, and now he swung his little used stick in a high ditto, indicating he meant business. Jerry said, sir, and then he realized he should have said chief. So he started again and his words came out, sir chief, which sounded odd, but he went on nonetheless. Sir chief, he said, if you find the man with this sort of hat, you can tell whether it's our man or not because of the hat our man will have, will have a red crayon mark inside the band where Dick Badger marked it up at the res and the hats of the innocents will not. Here's a picture of them showing the, the picture they drew of the unsavory character. Chief, Larimer twirled his billy stick. If he marked his hat, he said, why didn't he turn the man over to me so I could jail him? When it was explained that they had seen only the hat and not the man himself, Chief Larimer was very interested. He was more impressed than ever that Rachel and Jerry had had the sense to draw a picture of him since they had only seen his hat. He wished that the people who came and complained to him about people stealing their chickens had one half the sense. The children then gave Chief Larimore one of their clippings from the Cranberry Chronicle with Ginger's picture labeled Intellectual Dog and a story of him on the fire escape. Then Chief remembered having read the story. I thought at the time, he said chuckling, what kind of breed dog is that? Intellectual Dog. He thumbtacked the drawing and the clipping on the bulletin board and they looked very impressive. Well, he said, he obviously meant they could all go now. I pick up stray dogs now and then, he said. Next time I pick one up, if no one claims it, I'll give it to you. He meant this kindly, but Jerry gulped and said, no thanks. After all, it was Ginger he wanted, not some other dog. Now, having told Chief Larimore there was nothing more for the pies to do but continue the search and hope the chief was searching too in places they would not know about. On the way home from town, they happened to meet Sam Duty. They told him about the loss of Ginger Pie and he was very angry. If I ever catch the fellow who stole your dog, I'll thrash the living daylights out of him, he said. He was still grinning because Sam Duty was always grinning, but there was an angry glint in his eye. He promised to look over all the tall fences and to keep an eye out everywhere he went. He was especially interested when Rachel told him it was the dollar he had given Jerry for dusting the pews that had bought Ginger in the first place. Dick Badger's father ran an ad free every day for two weeks in the lost and found column of the Cranberry Chronicle, but nothing came of this. They should run it in the headlines, not in the small lost and found type, thought Jerry. Naturally, since the ads were free, he said nothing. Uncle Benny was almost inconsolable. 
Ginger back yet? He asked every Saturday when he came to lunch. Everyone shook his head, too heavy hearted to say anything. Uncle Benny saw that Jerry and Rachel felt very badly, half heartedly, knowing it would not compensate. He offered them his bubba. Ginger come back soon, he promised them to make them feel better. And he added importantly, Uncle Ginger, uh, Uncle Benny find Ginger, I find. Many children in Cranberry helped Jerry and Rachel search for Ginger, the dog with the pencil. Sometimes they met at the flagpole on the green and separated, going six different directions, trusting once was bound to be right, some racing, some crying, I know just where to look. Most often, Dick Badger joined in the searching. Duke was told to stick his nose to the ground and behave like a bloodhound. Duke behaved like a bloodhound, but he didn't find Ginger. He found only a great many peculiar objects, which he brought to Dick and laid at his feet, hoping wistfully that these were what he meant by the earnest pleading. He even scratched his stomach without anybody scratching his back, but apparently this didn't do either. Sometimes Rachel and her friend, Addie Egan, went searching on their own. I never knew we'd meet a villain in real life, said Rachel to Addie Egan one day when they were off searching, only in books. A what? asked Addie Egan respectfully. Her admiration for her best friend was boundless, but she had never heard that expression. A villain, said Rachel patiently. Oh, said Addie thoughtfully, then rather hesitantly, for it did not seem good policy to correct her defender, and everybody would still be saying she had cooties, and even calling her cootie if it had not been for Rachel. She said, I thought the word was pronounced villain. No, said Rachel confidently, it's villain, like a million. I think it's villain, said Addie Egan bravely. No, said Rachel. Villain. It must be villain because villain sounds more villainous than villain, than villain, the way you say it. Rachel Pye liked words. Sometimes, however, she attached the wrong meaning to a word. For instance, the word detestable. She thought detestable meant awfully nice. It sounded just like another way of saying awfully nice to her. For a time, she had a habit of saying detestable to everyone who came to the house, especially to Miss Meadow, who gave Jerry lessons on the piano. Hello, detestable, Rachel would greet Miss Meadow affectionately, not understanding why Mama and Miss Meadow always laughed. After a while, Mama explained the true meaning of the word to Rachel. Detestable means horrid and not awfully nice at all. At first, Rachel could not believe it. Detestable sounded nice to her. Then, when she was convinced, she was appalled. She really liked Miss Meadow, and what could she be thinking being called detestable the moment she walked in the door? But Miss Meadow seemed to consider the nickname funny and took no offense. However, to make amends, Mama suggested that Rachel give Miss Meadow a very sweet little gilt vanity case, which Rachel had gotten from the grocery store from saving coffee coupons. Rachel had meant to keep pennies in it, for it was just the right size for pennies and had, moreover, a little gilt chain attached to it. At the end of the chain was a little ring. You could wear the ring on your finger. But Mama said she should give the vanity case to Miss Meadow. Rachel was far too young for vanities anyway, she said. So Rachel had. Miss Meadow was delighted and filled it up with talcum powder instead of pennies. She hadn't caught on the idea that it would be marvelous for pennies, and Rachel did miss the little case. She then, at Mama's suggestion, tried switching her greeting from hello detestable to hello adorable, but it never sounded as good, and she dropped everything but the hello pretty soon. Now, Addie Egan might possibly be right about the word being villain and not villain, but Rachel certainly hoped she was wrong in the view that villain just simply sounded a great deal better. She graciously said, we'll look it up in the dictionary and then you'll see it's villain, villainous. And off they went up one street and down the other calling Ginger, Ginger. Although at first a great many children helped Rachel and Jerry hunt for ginger pie. After a while, they grew tired of the same old search. Though they all promised to keep their eyes open for the man whose picture they had examined at town hall and his hat, which Jerry had described, one by one they dropped off. Then only Jerry and Rachel looked, either together or by themselves. They never got any clues to where their puppy might be, but they never gave up hope. Too many people know about the funny hat, said Jerry. Naturally, he won't wear it anymore, the unsavory character, said Jerry, giving character to the same pronunciation as chief of police hat. Character. Oh, exclaimed Rachel, almost overwhelmed at Jerry's smartness in figuring this out. In the evening now, Jerry and Rachel had a new game they played. They drew their own funny papers, dividing a sheet of paper into four or six little squares for the pictures and the captions. As they always had, 
as the villain, the man, the unsavory character they had pictured him in the original drawing, the person who had stolen their dog, Ginger. Although Jerry and Rachel never said this out loud, they had a silent mutual agreement of the wonderful nighttime adventures of Martin Bomber Nichols would not ever be carried, continued, would not be continued ever again, not until the return of Ginger Pie. It was hard as the days went by and no sign or trace of Ginger had appeared for them to keep hoping that he would return. But they did hope this, and so did Uncle Benny. Uncle Benny solemnly, ass solemnly assured them over and over that he would find the puppy for them. Whenever any of them thought of Ginger coming running back, they thought of him as a little puppy when he disappeared. They forgot he would grow. Meanwhile, they called Ginger, Ginger, all over the place. I want to show you this little cartoon in funny paper that Jerry and Rachel wrote. The first little square, it says... The unsavory character is gone. We have the smarter dog. And in this one it says, Ginger is safe in the backyard. I smell a rat. Where's my finger? There we go. All the way over there. The kitty cat says, I smell a rat. This one says, a drumstick. Hurry. Hooray. And this one, it, it's really hard to read. It says, we have three chickens. The other one says, I wish Ginger was in here. And then number three says, come here, little dog. A bone candy. And Ginger says, bow wow, which really means, I wish I could get out of this old backyard. And then the fourth picture over here. The villain says, now I will make my getaway with the smart dog. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, so that's what we read. Tomorrow, it's called Skeleton Houses. Doesn't that sound sneaky? We'll see you then. I love you. Bye.